In this section, we're going to look at how we can get activity and screen lifecycle callbacks into our injectable objects. This will allow you to keep things isolated from your activity and controller classes while still being able to clean them up and reinitialize them at the appropriate time. The activity lifecycle task will be an abstract class that objects can extend if they wish to get activity lifecycle callbacks. We'll simply inject the set of activity lifecycle tasks that Dagger compiles for us and call through the relevant methods on each task in the base activity. The screen lifecycle task will have callbacks for when the screen is shown to the user, when it goes in the back stack or is popped, and when it is destroyed. As you see in the animation, when a new screen is pushed, the screen lifecycle task for the previous screen receives the on exit scope callback. The income incoming screens tasks receive an on enter scope callback. When a screen is popped, its tasks on exit scope gets called, followed by on destroy. And now the screen that was in the back stack calls on enter scope for all of its tasks since it's now the visible screen. Some examples of what you might do in these callbacks are updating the toolbar in on enter scope, stop listening for click events in on exit scope, and disposing of any disposables from the activity level in on destroy. We will take advantage of these new tasks more in future sections, but the things we'll cover in this section are converting our screen navigator implementations to be self-reliant as activity lifecycle tasks, and we will also create objects to handle the toolbar setup for each of our screens, and then we'll look a little bit more into dagger multi-bindings and how we use them. As much as we try to avoid it, there are times when we want to get lifecycle callbacks in our injected classes. This could be to stop receiving a specific broadcast when the application is backgrounded, or to release a reference to the activity in some helper class. Using Dagger's multi-binding, we can inject a set of classes that our activity can propagate lifecycle events to. Let's start by creating a new package called Lifecycle, and in there, create a class called Activity Lifecycle Task. This class will be abstract and just have empty methods for all of the relevant lifecycle events. For now, we will add ones for onCreate, onStart, onResume, onPause, onStop, and onDestroy. We're making this an abstract class and just making them empty methods rather than abstract methods since all the subclasses may not need all of the lifecycle events, so we don't want to force every subclass to implement every method. For each of those callbacks, we're going to pass a reference to the activity, so our helper classes can either get a reference to a view or use the activity if they need to. The nice thing about this is since our activity lifecycle tasks will get a callback to on destroy, we can clear the activity reference if we're holding on to it in that specific task. Now let's open the base activity class and inject the set of activity lifecycle tasks that Dagger will compile for us. And all we have to do here is simply loop through all of the tasks in each of the lifecycle methods and call the relevant lifecycle event on that task. There's a little bit of setup here, but obviously we only have to do this once. And now anytime we add a activity lifecycle task to our dagger object graph, it will get the callbacks automatically. If we tried to build the application now, it would fail because dagger would say there are no activity lifecycle tasks to put into a set to inject. We're going to change that in the next video, and once we get to the screen lifecycle tasks, we'll look into how we could handle the case of there not being an item in the multi-bindings to inject. In this video, we're going to make our screen navigator implementations extend our new activity lifecycle task class. This will allow us to make the screen navigator initialization and cleanup completely self-contained. In the UI package, create an interface called Router Provider. 
We're going to have our activity implement this interface. It's going to expose a method to get a router and also have an initial screen method. And this matches the abstract method in our base activity. The reason we're going to have this in an interface is just to make our code slightly cleaner. It'll become more clear when we actually use this, but instead of having to cast our activity to base activity, we can just cast it to this interface. Again, that's a personal preference. It's not a huge deal, but this gives us nice separation. Now let's open the base activity class and implement this new interface. We only have to add the get router method since this class is already providing an initial screen abstract method. So we either need to change the visibility of this to public, or we could just get rid of it altogether since the interface will still force subclasses to implement the method. Either way works. If we go to our main activity, we see nothing changed besides the visibility modifier and we're good to go. Now in the screen navigator interface, remove the init with router and clear methods. These will be handled by the activity lifecycle task callbacks. Back in the base activity, we can remove the calls to those methods. We still need to keep the screen navigator injected since we're using that in the overridden on backed press call. Now we need to update our screen navigator implementations. Tations. Open the default screen navigator class and extend activity lifecycle task. Next, override on create, and the first thing we'll check is that the activity argument is an instance of router provider. If not, we'll just throw an exception giving a helpful error message. Now we can simply call our previous init with router method using the get router and initial screen getters from the router provider interface. Remove the override annotation and change the method to be package private. Next, override on destroy and move the simple clearing of the router reference from our clear method up there. And now we can remove the clear method completely. Since we're going to be injecting this class to satisfy two different dependencies, one for the screen navigator and for the activity lifecycle task, we need to move our scope annotation to this class rather than have it on the binds method in our module. So let's add that and then we'll go and fix our module. Open the navigation module class and remove the scope annotation from the screen navigator provider method. Now we'll add one using binds and into set annotations. And this will return an activity lifecycle task and we can just name it bind screen navigator task and pass in the same method argument. So what this is telling Dagger is I have an activity lifecycle task that I want you to put into a set and then we provide the implementation of that task. Now we need to fix our UI test implementations of the screen navigator. First, we'll open the test navigation module and add a method just like we did in module to bind our test screen navigator into a set of activity lifecycle tasks. Now let's open the test screen navigator class. Extend activity lifecycle task and we'll update the javadoc for override initial controller to reference the router provider interface now. We can no longer inject the default screen navigator because Dagger will not allow us to inject a lower scope, the activity scope, into a higher scope, a singleton, which is what our test screen navigator is. We can simply just create a new default screen navigator instead and assign that to our field. Over override on create and add the same check for router provider that we did in our default screen navigator.
Next, we'll move our ternary up. That's checking which controller should be our launch controller. And instead of root screen, we will just call initial screen from our router provider. Now we can call the init with router method on our default screen navigator with the router from the router provider and our launch controller. Then just delete the init with router method in this class. Next, override on destroy and simply propagate that call to our default screen navigator on destroy method. Then we can delete the clear method in this class. That should be all we have to fix. Now, since we have UI tests for our screens, we can just go ahead and run those and verify that everything still passes. And that should be enough to give us confidence that our changes worked fine. Everything passed, so looks like we're safe. This is a pretty simple example of what you can do with an activity lifecycle task. And obviously this can be extended to many different objects. And in future lessons, we will take advantage of this. Next, we're going to take a look at how to do something similar for our screen life cycles. Now we're going to make a life cycle task for screens. Start by creating a screen life cycle task class in the life cycle package. This will be an abstract class and have three methods. First will be on enter scope and that'll take in a view argument. This will be called when the controller becomes visible to the user. So it's the top controller in the back stack. To allow our task to get view references, we're passing in the controller's parent view to this call. Next is on exit scope. And this will be called when the controller is put in the back stack or popped. This would be where you'd want to clear any view references you have. And finally, we'll have on destroy. And this is called when the controller is destroyed. Remember, since controller instances are kept across config changes, this callback is essentially the same as the screen scope being destroyed. Here you'd want to clear any disposables or other activity level listeners that you have. Now open the base controller class and at the top inject a set of screen lifecycle tasks, similar to how we did in the base activity. Now we're going to override the on change started method. This is a callback we get from the controller super class that lets us know when this controller is either being pushed or popped slash put in the back stack. Here we can loop through all of the screen lifecycle tasks and call the respective methods depending on the change type. So if this is an enter change type, we can call on enter scope. Otherwise we'll call on exit scope. Lastly, we just need to override on destroy, loop, loop through all of our tasks and call the on destroy method. Now, what if we have screens that won't have any screen lifecycle tasks? Right now, Dagger would throw a compilation error saying that there are no screen lifecycle tasks to inject. Since there may be a case where we have a simple screen with no tasks, we need a way to make Dagger compile. Luckily, such a way exists and it's pretty simple. Create a class in the base package called screen module. This will be a module that we will add to all of our screen components. Add an abstract method annotated with multi binds. The method type will be set of screen lifecycle task and the name can be anything you want. What the multi binds annotation does is tell Dagger that an object in the dependency graph will be injecting a set of screen lifecycle tasks. And if there are no items to put in that set, then just give it an empty set. Now let's add this module to our two screen components. Open the repo details component and on the subcomponent annotation, add a modules value with open brackets and just add screen module dot class. We'll do the same for the trending repos component. Let's see how this looks in the generated code. Run a build and open the repo details component impl class, which is what Dagger generates. 
In here, we can see our repo details controller members injector, and it just has a set factory dot empty call. So this is providing an empty set to the base controller, which is what our repo details controller extends. This would be the same for our trending repos component implementation as well. This is what the multi binds annotation does for us. It allows us to inject an empty set when no bindings for that set or map exist. Now that we have our screen lifecycle task framework created, we can use it to handle the toolbar UI as screens get pushed or popped. We'll look at that in the next video. In this video, we're going to make some objects in each of our screen scopes that will update the toolbar title, and in the case of our details screen, add the back button to the toolbar and handle clicks on that. I personally find having the toolbar in the screen's layout to be the easiest way to manage it throughout the app. However, you can have the toolbar provided by the activity layout and update it from your screen scoped classes as well. That would require just a slight change in the structure of what we're going to build in this video, and I'll detail that in a short article after this video. The first thing we need to do is update the layouts of our screens so that they contain a toolbar. Since we're going to use the same one for each screen, we'll make a separate layout resource for that. Create a new layout resource file called app bar. The parent layout will be an app bar layout. We'll have the width be match parent and the height be action bar size. And then set the background to be the color primary. This will have one child, the support toolbar, and we can just do match parent for both width and height. We'll give it an ID of toolbar and we'll set the text color to be white and we'll create a color resource for that. To use this in our screens layout, we'll open first our trending repos layout and we just want to wrap this in a coordinator layout. Once we have our coordinator layout defined, we can move our original screens layout inside that and above that, use the include tag to add our app bar layout. Then we'll add a scrolling view behavior to our frame layout and the coordinator will automatically pad our frame layout to be below our app bar. Now let's do the same thing for our screen repo details layout. We'll move the namespace declarations up to our parent layout and that should fix our preview. Next, open the styles.xml file and change the style name to be no action bar. So we don't want the framework to automatically add an action bar since we're providing our own. Now in the trending package, create a class called trending repos UI manager. This will extend screen lifecycle task and have a screen scope annotation. Create an inject constructor so we, constructor so we can inject this from a module. Now override on enter scope and call butterknife.bind passing in this in the view. We'll assign that to an unbinder field that we can create. And then we can use the bind view annotation to get a reference to our toolbar. And now we can call toolbar.setTitle and pass in a string resource that we'll create. Now we want to clean up our view references in on exit scope, so override that. And instead of doing the checks that we have been before, we're going to create a utility class for Butterknife. So create a package called util, and then create a class called Butterknife Utils. This is going to be a class that for now just has one static method called unbind, and we can pass it an unbinder. Butterknife will throw an exception if you try to call unbind on an unbinder that has already cleared its references. So we're going to wrap this in a try and we will just log the exception. 
This is definitely something to investigate if you see happening. However, it's the sort of error that I do not think you should crash your app for, but it is worth investigating if you see it happening. We'll use that new utility method here and on exit scope to clear our view bindings. And now we need to create a new module for our trending repos component. We'll just call it a trending repos screen module. Make this abstract. And we can now bind our UI manager into the set of screen lifecycle lifecycle tasks, just like we did with the activity lifecycle tasks. And then we'll add this module to our trending repos component. So now that dependency that we provided in that module is available to this component scope. That takes care of the trending repos UI manager. So now let's do one for the details screen. And this is going to have a little bit extra because we're going to put a back button in the toolbar and handle clicks on that. So go to the details package and create a repo details UI manager class. Extend screen lifecycle task, make this a screen scoped dependency and create the inject constructor. And on enter scope, again, we will bind our views using butter knife and assign that to an unbinder field. Create our toolbar field using the bind view annotation like before. Now, instead of setting the title using a string resource, we're going to use the repo name. So you see, we inject the repo name here. We'll go ahead and copy this and inject it into our UI manager as well. Create a field for that, and now we can use this string and just call set title with the string value on our toolbar. Now we need an icon to show for a back button in our toolbar. We'll just use a built-in vector, so if we go to new vector asset on your drawable folder, click on the icon browser, and select the back. We'll rename it to IC underscore back. And then we'll change the color to white so we can open the XML that that created and just change the color, change the color. Now we can call toolbar.set navigation icon and use that new drawable. Now let's set a navigation on click listener. And what we want to do here is pop this screen. So how can we do that? Well, we can just go back up to our constructor and inject the screen navigator, since that's available to everything in this scope. Create a field for that. And in the click listener, just call screen navigator.pop. And this is one of my favorite things about Dagger. When you find that you need a new dependency in one of your classes, normally you can just add that to the injectable constructor and it's just automatically there. You don't have to go back and find out where you called new repo details UI manager and update that because you never have to manually call that. So if you use Dagger, most things should be injectable and you can add them as you need them. Now override on exit scope and we will go ahead and clear out that navigation click listener. And after that, use our butter knife util method to unbind our view. Now create a new module, call it repo details screen module. This will be just like our trending repo screen module. It'll be abstract and provide that one lifecycle task, that one screen lifecycle task. And then we can go ahead and add this to our repo details component. And that should finish up all of our UI manager stuff. Now let's run this and see how this looks. So we have our trending repos title, and if we select a repo, it gets updated with the repo name. Our back button pops the screen, pops the screen just like if you were to hit the Android back button. And everything looks good. We can rotate and see all of our logic is still working fine. Our title stays updated, our back button still works. So everything is getting attached and detached correctly in the UI managers. And that's it for this one. Next, we're going to learn how to manage disposables in different scopes using a disposable manager class.
Rather than having to rely on activity lifecycle tasks or screen lifecycle tasks, it would be nice if our RxJava disposables would automatically dispose themselves at the right time. Since we completely own our injection lifecycle using the activity injector and screen injector that we created, that would be a perfect place to execute the disposing of a collection of disposables for that scope. Let's start off this video by creating a disposable manager class in the lifecycle package. This is going to be a really simple class. It will just have a private final composite disposable field that will hold on to all of our added disposables. It will have one method called add, and that will take in a var arg of disposables. So this will work for adding one disposable or multiple. And then we can simply call add all on our composite disposable for that. And then it will have another method called dispose. And this is where we will call clear on our composite disposable which will dispose of any disposables added to it, but also let us use it again. So that's why we're using clear. We're going to need a new qualifier. So in the DI package, create a class called for screen. And this is going to be an annotation. And we need to add the qualifier annotation as well as retention of runtime. So now we can have potentially a screen disposable manager and an activity disposable manager. We're only going to go over the screen level here since we have a single activity app. Open the screen module class and we're going to add a provider for the disposable manager. We'll use provides, make it screen scoped, and use the qualifier for screen. And this will be a static method since we have to actually return a value. And then we can just return new disposable manager. So now our screens will all be able to inject a disposable manager using the qualifier for screen. If we open the screen injector class, we can see down here in the clear method, this is where we'd want to call the dispose on our disposable manager. So how can we get a reference to that by using the component? Create a new interface called screen component. This is going to have a type parameter and it will extend the Android injector interface with that type parameter. We'll add one method here, and it'll have our qualifier annotation, and it'll just be our disposable manager. In a Dagger component, if you add a method, that means that that dependency from your Dagger depend can be retrieved by calling this method on the interface. So we'll be able to call disposable manager if we cast a component to screen component and get that disposable manager. Now let's open both of our existing screen components and change them to extend screen component rather than Android injector directly. Now both of these will have that method provided so we can get the disposable manager off of them. And since it's provided in the screen module, both of these components do have a disposable manager to provide. If that wasn't the case, Dagger would fail the build just like it would if you were trying to inject something that wasn't available. Now back in our screen injector class, we can get a reference to the object that was returned when we called remove from our map. So we'll assign that to an Android injector. And now we can check if this injector is an instance of screen component, instance of screen component we can call injector.disposable manager, which is that method we added, and simply call dispose. So this is the plus about writing things like screen injectors or activity injectors yourself. We have access to all of this information and all of these steps. So while it was a little bit of boilerplate at the beginning to create these, it gives us a lot more flexibility in the future to do things like this. Open the rebuild details presenter and we will use our new disposable manager. We have to inject it with the qualifier and now we can just wrap this in disposable manager.add. And remember, anytime you call to subscribe, you get a disposable returned. And now this call is added to our disposable manager and it will be disposed of if this screen is popped. We'll do the same for the trending repos presenter. Now, since this is our home screen, it's going to be unlikely that this happens often. Still, it's a good way to demonstrate how to use this. And it's a good idea to always have 
some sort of logic that's handling your disposables correctly. Since we changed the constructor arguments for our presenters, we have to update our tests. So first we'll go to the trending repos presenter test. And at the bottom where we are initializing it, we can just call mock with disposable manager and Makito will create a mock for us. Let's do the same for the repo details presenter test. And now let's run all of our tests to make sure everything still works. Our unit tests are looking good. Let's make sure our UI tests are passing. And those are looking good as well. So that covers this section of lifecycle callbacks. We're going to make more use of these, especially the screen and activity lifecycle tasks in future lessons. But I hope that this showed you what is possible and what you can do while still maintaining a good separation from the Android.